Just resuscitated from suspended animation aboard the Discovery One, it's the Digiga. Please welcome two critics who have not aged in 30 years, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> Is that really how you feel? I mean, I, I feel pretty good. I don't know. Uh, 30 years. 30 years? I, I feel pretty good. Is that how you feel? Not that I can tell how much someone has aged by listening to a voice. Uh, yeah. Reference. You two seem to often refer to celebrities who have not, quote, aged in 30 years. Close quote. Well, fine. So, uh, in that case, Corey, who, uh, who was responsible for sending that one in? That was sent in by Phil Vader, who included lots of helpful notes, all of which we just read out loud. You're welcome, Phil. <laughs> uh, I had a conversation with Corey. You did. <laughs> it was as if he was as if he was really here. I enjoy doing that. It's silly, but I like doing it. Wait, I'm on LinkedIn right now. What so are you doing? I'm trying to find a job. Oh uh, yeah. Hate my job. Yeah. By the way, so I was on LinkedIn the other day. Yeah. And I got a uh, invitation, you know, to your, yeah. you know, contacts, connections, yeah. whatever, with uh, my ex girlfriend Brenda. Oh, I think I remember Brenda. She was the one who was Anthony Hopkins' personal yes, trainer. Yes, 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 yes. That whole thing. Yes, yes, yes. That episode. We had a horrible breakup, and she just tried to connect with me on LinkedIn, and it says, "Accept, ignore, accept, ignore." It's got to be ignore. Really. You're gonna really? It's weird. You know, she she was she was like borderline. Yeah, but she had like just, borderline just... personality. I if, if I accept it, I mean, yeah. who knows what she yeah. she'll think? All she'll right. probably think I want to get back together. She'll start calling me five times a day. Oh, that wouldn't be good. No, because I have a girlfriend who's only five thousand miles away in Paris. She'll be here by the way the week of uh, July 9th. Oh, terrific! Oh yeah, be here for a week and a half. Yeah, well, I uh, I will be in Jordan. We talked about that last week. Yes, I, I, I still think that's a joke. It's not. I'm my my ticket has been bought. My ticket is bought. I'm flying Emirates. I don't I don't know exactly know where. We're uh, we've got a uh, a big. We're having a departure meeting of sorts, talking about what uh, actually this week, end of this week. So uh, so what? We, oh, so you don't know where you're flying into? I I well I, I'm assuming I'm I'm going to fly into Amman. That's the only place you fly into in Jordan. That's where Emirates flies. Uh, so I'll be flying into Amman, and then it's uh, about a 50, I think it's about a 50-mile drive due uh, east of Amman. So uh, Now, are you going to live in the refugee camp? I have, I have, I have no they, clue. They put you up in like a four, like four seasons while the kids I, I, are I eating no their clue. iPad because they, they can't eat? <laughs> I have no clue. I have no clue. Now, will I you teach no the kids in the refugee camps while they're eating their gruel with no clothes on how to be Zack Snyder? I, I, yeah, there you go. Uh, no, I, you know, I don't often talk about this, but uh, you know, my mother was a war refugee. So I, I do have some uh, affinity for people who've been through that ordeal. And uh, I, I would like to believe that I have a few things few things I've learned on this podcast that I will convey to them. Uh, so, yeah. Now, can the kids sell the iPad on eBay so that they can clothe themselves? <laughs> yeah, stop. No. It's, you know what, one of these days, you, you will eat all of those jokes when one of these kids grows up. And you, know makes, what, you know what? If one of them grows up, I'll, I'll And I'll makes an extraordinary iPad. movie. One of these kids is going to grow up and make an ex, maybe many of them and make an extraordinary okay. movie about their experiences, and it will be Oscar nominated. And uh, people they'll, they'll will They'll thank you. And they will. And then, and you know what? I would like to thank Wade Major. I don't need thanks, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, this uh, helps them get out of dry dock and uh, and realize that they can they can that their stories mean something, and that they can share them with other people. So, in any case. In any case, uh, yeah, enough. You, you. I thought I was the cynical one, and uh, anyway. So uh, let's uh, let's let's talk about a little bit of music right off the off the top of the show. Music. Yeah, do some music. And, Holy uh, Christ! Yeah, we got some uh, classical stuff too. So let me let me uh, make mention really quickly. I'll let Mark do uh, do some some rock and roll here in a moment. Uh, we, we've got uh, three. 
interesting titles that come from uh, Shout Factory, part of Shout Broadway. They are doing, uh, and I hope they do more of these, actually. Uh, they're, they're releasing Blu-rays of Broadway musicals, and uh, they got three really, really good ones. Uh, Brent Barrett and Rachel York in uh, a, the revival of Kiss Me, Kate, which is terrific. Uh, if you love Cole Porter, you're, you just, it's, it, it, it's timeless. It's absolutely terrific. Uh, this, was, uh, not, this is not like a recent, recent revival, but it's relatively recent from 1999, uh, the original Tony-winning musical was from 1949, so this was sort of on the 50th anniversary of uh, Kiss Me, Kate. And uh, for those who don't know, Kiss Me, Kate is, yes, it is The Taming of the Shrew, done as a Cole Porter musical, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's really, really a lot of fun. It's it's uh, just just a beautiful revival. And then they have Hugh Jackman in Oklahoma, and uh, that guy just does not freaking age, man. I know he's all kind of crusty-looking in Logan, but... Really, he still he's looks awesome. good. He uh, still looks great. I think he's awesome. He's a lot younger here, but he's still just the... He's, he's kind of underappreciated, actually. He's the Hugh jackman He's just great. Uh, and uh, it's really fun. There's a featurette on this as well, and uh, he just kills it. You know, he disappears into every role he does, and he's just the... He's like our... our he's a musical theater treasure. And then the last one here is an actual movie, but they are releasing it as part of the Shout Broadway line, which I think is probably kind of smart. And this is the film version of Man of La Mancha with Peter O'Toole, Sophia Loren, and James Coco, Mark's favorite. James Coco! Mark loves James Sweet. Coco. Uh, Arthur Hiller directed this, and uh, which is a, a little unusual and strange to think of, but uh, he did indeed. And uh, you know what? It's not... Man of La Mancha has always been a bit of a weird stage production. Peter O'Toole is kind of a strange Don Quixote. Uh, Sophia Loren is perfect in everything she does. She's just impossible to cast poorly. Um, but you know what? The movie still is a lot of fun to watch, and uh, it, it hails from just the tail end of the great musical eras, 1972. It was overshadowed that year by uh, Fiddler on the Roof, which was a far superior musical. But that was kind of the end of the musical era, really, 1972. It sort of wafted then into Greece and, you know, more modern musicals. But the the sort of traditional show tune musical, you're kind of there at the tail end with Oliver and Funny Girl and then this movie and uh, and Fiddler. But Again, it all, you know, it all ended with Cabaret. Cabaret really was kind of... Cabaret's that was kind of great... A tra- I would almost argue Cabaret's a transition point, to be honest. Uh, but that is, of course, also 1972. So it's it's it, that's uh, 72 is the is the year. I should teach a class on that. I'd love to teach a class. Well, you know, well, you should teach it in Jordan. That's what I should refugee do. Refugee kids. Uh, so Man of La Mancha with uh, Peter O'Toole, Sophia Loren, James Coco from Shout on Blu-ray, along with uh, the uh, rev- revival of Kiss Me Kate and Oklahoma with Hugh Jackman. Really terrific. Let's hope uh, more stuff comes out from Shout Broadway. Uh, Wade, we have a little uh, CD to talk about. We have our CDs. Yeah. Put it in your CD player, not that you have one of those. Uh, Simple Minds, acoustic in concert. Simple Minds, if you do not know them, they were uh, bigger in the 80s when they had uh, that great song from uh, Breakfast Club, Don't You Forget About Me. Uh, But they had other hits, too, including Sanctify Yourself, which I do remember, Alive and Kicking, which kind of sounds like Don't You Forget About Me. Uh, and some other stuff, too. Here they are in 2016 singing their songs acoustic, which is kind of a cool thing. So if you like them or you miss them, this is kind of a good way to introduce yourself to them. Uh, Simple Minds Acoustic in Concert. Then we have like a weird thing going on here called Rocktopia. Um, Rocktopia is a very strange combination of classic rock and uh, and like opera. It's... It's uh, it's these one of a kind arrangements featuring you know works by like Beethoven and Handel and Mozart, but the arrangements were done by rock bands like Farner and Hart and Journey and. That Sticks. sounds like something that would be either horrible or really awesome. <laughs> um, it's sort of both. Okay. Some of these you're like, I guess if I guess if th- this is probably the only way I could ever sit through an opera. From Budapest. Yes. Was this in Budapest? Well, this is recorded at uh, at the Hungarian State Opera. So, oh. yes it was. You know, I've been there. You have not. Yeah, I have actually. You've been in the Hungarian State Opera. Yeah. Yeah, went to went to a couple of concerts when I was there for my uh for my birthday many years ago when my wife took me there for uh for a significant birthday, let's just say. 
This was uh, about a decade ago, but uh, for a significant birthday. Anyway, yeah, no, actually, I mean, it's really old, old, but yeah, it's a nice venue. All right, wow. Anyway, huh. it's definitely a, uh, it's definitely yeah. something for the uh, those in your family with adventurous musical tastes. Very nice. A um, bunch of stuff from Naxos here. Really cool stuff from Naxos. Uh, let me get through this as quickly and expeditiously as I can because Mark always rides me for doing the classical stuff. Uh, Stola Kleiberg. Oh, Stola Kleiberg. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Did I pronounce that correctly? All of our listeners right now, they're riveted. Yeah. They cannot okay. wait to hear more. So Stola Kleiberg, a uh, composer I'm not that familiar with, but uh, Mass for the Modern Man. This is a Blu-ray audio. Uh, very, very nice. I'm not a huge fan of Masses. Like the Misa Solemnis by Beethoven is probably the one that I can tolerate the best because it's Beethoven. Uh, but this is by the Trondheim Symphony Orchestra and Choir. Uh, as far as modern Masses go, this is, uh, this is quite lovely. Um, then we've also got... Uh, Verdi's Otello in a new production from the Macerata Opera Festival. Um, you know, it's Otello. It's, uh, it's Verdi's Otello. It's terrific. It's great. Every production is, is more or less pretty great. This one is too. And that is from Dynamic. This is uh, also from Dynamic is uh, Donizetti's Rosmonda. I'm not familiar with it. I'm vaguely familiar with Donizetti. They've sent us a lot of Donizetti lately, so he appears to be a, a guy who's getting a, a little bit of attention. This is kind of a, an avant-garde interpretation of, uh, of the opera. I'm not, uh, I'm, I have a hard time kind of following it, but, you know, uh, for opera fans, it's, uh, you know, it's decent. We also have a uh, Blu-ray DVD combo set from Marinsky of the Golden Cockerel. Uh, which is a uh, from you know Rimsky Korsakov uh, for those who uh, are f- you know big fans of Rimsky Korsakov opera. Uh, this also is a um, uh, kind of an avant-garde interpretation. Didn't really work for me. I'm not a huge fan of Russian opera necessarily, but uh, you know for those who who like it, I go for it. Knock yourselves out. Uh, John Cage, the works for percussion. With Bonnie Whiting, this is um, uh, called Music for Speaking Percussionist, and it's kind of a uh, sort of a uh, it, it's four four different pieces that were specifically written uh, by John Cage as kind of workshops for percussion, as I understand it. And uh, there's also a 73 minute interview on here with uh, Whiting and percussionist uh, Alan Ott, who's a bit of an expert on Cage, which is which helps explain this. It's a little bit, you know, if you're not a major artsy percussionist, won't mean much to you. Prokofiev's Cinderella, absolutely fantastic and beautiful. This is from Opus Arte, done by the Dutch National Ballet. Can't get enough. I watched the Disney Cinderella again the other day. By the way, we had family in town, obviously, for my. Uh, my mother-in-law's birthday, and everybody wanted to watch Cinderella. What a Aww. great movie that is! What a great movie that is! Yeah, and then and then when she dies, not the, the animated, end. not the animated, the new live-action one from a couple oh, of years ago. Oh, really? Is that what you meant? The Kenneth Branagh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the uh, animated one sucks. The animated one kind of dates poorly, doesn't it? It does. Okay. It does a little bit. But Branagh just I I want him to make more movies. I really I love Kenneth Branagh. I really Murder do. On the Orient Express. I know. I know. I'm really looking forward to it. Is that weird? So am I. I am too. Even though it has Johnny Depp, who I'm getting sick of now. Well, even though Bran is playing Poirot himself, which I find a little bit odd, but, you know. Like, do you realize that no one who has ever played Poirot is actually French? Like, no one has ever played Poirot who is French. They've all been English actors. It's bizarre. Well, same with Superman yeah. and Batman. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, uh, by the way, my daughter is obsessed with Batman all of a sudden. Do you know this? Because when we were putting the mock documentary together for my mother-in-law, which I mentioned last week, um, you know, she's actually in Batman Returns. And I, I, I do a little bit in there. It's, it's very, very funny. You, would, you have to see this. I've got to show it to you because I have a bit where after, you know, where they show the, the, the newspaper where Penguin forgives his parents. And then the newspaper comes up and says, Penguin forgives parents. And there's a whole crowd scene. And she's floating around in that crowd. And I, I, I actually have voiceover from, um, uh, Mike, I think it was Michael Reschaffen at that point, who's talking about how amazed he was by her performance in uh, Batman Returns. And I freeze frame and draw a little red circle around her face, just masked somewhere in the back of the crowd. It's very, very funny. How did she wind up in that film? Extra. She's an extra. She was an extra in it. It's very funny. That was part of the joke of the mock documentary was her, her career as an extra. Anyway, uh, Blu-ray of the complete Brahms symphonies with... Uh, uh, Thomas Hengelbrock. Um, 
And uh, this is this also includes uh, some documentary stuff on here where Hengelbrock talks about Brahms. But honestly, uh, I'm not that familiar with Hengelbrock. But uh, the complete Brahms symphonies, which is all whopping four of them, it's not like Haydn or Mozart or anything, uh, is is lovely. So uh, they're great symphonies, and uh, this is a great uh, Blu-ray to appreciate them. And the last three, New York City Ballet in Paris. Uh, is perfect a perfect gift for any ballet fan. You will absolutely love it. Uh, Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, the otherwise known uh, as the Magic Flute, previously done in an amazing uh, film version by uh, Ingmar Bergman, and then also a version by Kenneth Branagh, who we were just talking about. Uh, this is done by the uh, Teatro alla Scala Accademia and uh, choir and orchestra, staged by Peter Stein. Uh, it's not the greatest version you've ever seen of the uh, Magic Flute, but it's, uh, it's it, you know, the music's amazing, so pretty much any version is al- always going to uh, thrill you. And then there is Verdi's Requiem Mass, otherwise known as the Messa de Requiem, with Gustavo, uh, our own local Gustavo Dudamel, the Los Angeles Master Chorale, the L.A. Uh, Philharmonic, at the Hollywood Bowl, and uh, that's beautiful. I was, you know, I was... Um, uh, I was, uh, and that brings me to what I'm going to talk about right now. I was at the Hollywood Bowl to see the live La La Land just a few weeks ago. Of course you were. And uh, it was amazing. Could I say that? It was absolutely amazing. Did Emma Stone and Ryan uh, Gosling show up? Uh, no, uh, they did not. But the night after, believe it or not, it's very funny, Francois Truffard, uh, director of the uh, Colcoa Film Festival here, City of Lights, City, City of Angels, City of Lights, which uh, uh, City of Lights, City of Angels, which we you were on the jury this last year. Uh, so and I and Francois did a bit for me in the mock documentary as well. Do you realize I got Malton and Rayner and Claudia and uh, Christy Lemire and Michael Reschaff and all of them did little bits for my mock documentary. I, it's weird. So Bob Strauss did not, Bob Strauss would have been funny. Bob Strauss, I, yes. I, I I couldn't get to Bob Strauss. God damn it! I got to Leonard Malton. Uh, but in any case, uh, so, no, the night after I went, Francois went and sat one box away from Emma Stone and, and took Ooh. pictures of her. And she was waving to him. Wow. Isn't that great? It's fantastic. You, you could have had your picture taken with Emma Stone. Well, in any case. Uh, but, no, it was absolutely amazing. You know, this was the, uh, the, the La La Land Live, and it was, uh, it was stunning. It was absolutely stunning. Uh, the, you know, the, the, it's, it's what they do at the Hollywood Bowl. And we, they've, they've done this with The Nightmare Before Christmas. They've done it with you know, some Disney animated films as well, where the film plays, and then you get to the musical numbers, and they are performed live for you. And here, even though the songs are still sung, they're being sung in the movie, all the orchestra, all the musical stuff, the piano, the, you know, the, the jazz, that is all done live on stage. And Justin Hurwitz was there conducting... And uh, it was amazingly tight. I, I wish I understood how they pull off some of these tricks because I think there has to be a digital way of syncing the movie to the orchestra as opposed to the other way around. Otherwise, I can't imagine it. it, it it's just too difficult. Wait, so they... Because the, 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 I mean, they, they have monitors, but it's, it's just... They were so tight. It was just so beautiful. So they stripped away all of the orchestration and just kept the Correct. vocals. Correct, yeah. And then the... Or the Musicians when you alive. think about the technical challenges of doing that, it is it's quite a feat. I think it's gonna I think it's gonna win Best Picture. Oh, shut up. No, it uh, and the other great thing they always do is that you know they they sort of embellish it with fireworks at certain points, like when there are fireworks and someone in the crowd at the end of it, fireworks go off for real from the uh, from the uh, the dome of the ball. So you know, and you get a lot of lighting effects and things. Um, I, I, for, you know, having seen a number of these things at the bowl, I gotta say this is, uh, apart from Nightmare Before, uh, Before Christmas, which they have had many years to fine tune, Danny Elfman and all the original, uh, voice artists, uh, this is about as tight and as impressive a production as I've ever seen at the bowl. It was really very impressive. Very, very nice. Really I went to stuff. the Simpsons one. Did you? How was that? It was okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, speaking of that, uh, let's see. So that's it for for music. Let us get into television. Mark, we have two giant bricks over here. I mean, that thing is one of the biggest box sets I've ever seen. And it's for a show no one cares about. I mean, who? So, I mean, this this show just limped along for like ten seasons. We are talking about Bones, uh, which, if you just want to get the final chapter, the final chapter of Bones nearly departed. Are are are. Uh, is out, and uh, that's, that'll, that'll cap it off for you. 
if you have if you've just straight up neglected to actually get anything from Bones waiting for the box set. Oh boy. Oh boy. So we have here the Flesh and Bones collection of Bones, and this thing is a monster. It's one of the biggest feel, box sets I've ever seen. Feel the seen. weight of this. Feel the weight of this. Feel how heavy this is. Well, there's like 12 seasons of this stupid show. It's ridiculous. This is insane. But anyway, here it is. Uh, the Flesh Who and Bones. this show? Uh, this, you know is, what? this is one of the shows. You know, what, you know, I guarantee this is one of those shows that probably did okay domestically, but they just found a way to monetize the crap out of it overseas, uh, and they just kept going with it. Emily Deschanel is wonderful. She is, of course, Caleb Deschanel's daughter uh, and and the sister of Zoe Deschanel, who is the new girl. So, uh, yeah, Emily Deschanel is terrific on this. I hope she, now that the show is over, I hope she goes on to bigger and better things because she deserves to. She really has, she's been trapped in television for 12 years. Uh, time to go do features. So go uh, hop to it, Emily. Uh, but, yeah, this includes uh, a thing here the uh, called Back to the Lab, a Bones retrospective, which is, seriously, these people have lived on this show for 12 years. And he was on Buffy before that. I mean, he was? Yeah, he was on Buffy before that. Uh, so in any case, wow, yeah, quite a thing. Tons and tons of extras, more than I could possibly even be willing to spend time with. Gobs and gobs of featurettes and uh, deleted scenes and gag reels and all this stuff. It just it goes on and on and on. So if you really love this show, boy, are you in for a treat. Uh, and you can also use this thing to uh, flatten meat. If you need to pound, you know, like make a pyar out of some chicken, uh, this is this will do it. This this big honking thing, just drop it on the chicken and it is flat. I I I just want to meet the person who's watched all twelve seasons worth of Bones and has to own that. Yeah, well, you know what? They're out they, there. They're out there. There are people who love that show. Now, speaking of people who love that show, oh, okay. Star Trek. We're not talking about Star Trek. No, we're not. But it's kind of related to Star Trek. Because, you see, when Star Trek infuriated everybody after being canceled after three seasons, and everyone was enraged, and they were upset, and what's, what are you thinking of, NBC? Why did you cancel Star Trek? Why did you do this to Gene Roddenberry and the fans? You took Star Trek off the air. What could you possibly put in its place? What could you possibly put in Star Trek's place that would be as good? Well, as it turns out, another legendary show. And that show is... Mark? Laugh-In. Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. That's right. Uh, Laugh-In is now out. The complete series. Another Honkin' Box set. It ran, didn't run 12 seasons, though. It ran from 1968 to 1973. Won Emmys. Won tons of awards. And uh, all 140 episodes from that five-year run are now here in this uh, fantastic uh, fantastic set. Now, there's something. Now, I want to point something out here too. They claim here that Laugh In, in, in the notes that accompany this, they claim that Laugh In was uh, a replacement for the Man from Uncle on Mondays at 8 p.m. But you see, that's not quite correct. And uh, it, well, the story that is that it replaced Star Trek after Star Trek got canceled. Yes, correct. So the, the it, it gets into it gets into some nuances. There are some weeds about this, but for the sake of that, you know, I get it. They don't want to claim that they're the ones that bump Star Trek. So fine, you replace the man from Uncle on Mondays at eight p.m. Fair enough. But the reason that Star Trek was canceled was to make way for Laugh In. So regardless of all the other details, time slots, and so forth, the actual story here is that Star Trek was canceled for the birth of Laugh-In. So the resources and the money could be directed at Laugh-In. They wanted to put the energies toward Laugh-In. So, you know, Star Trek bounced around in this time slot as well. And I, and I get a little, I get a little, you know, I, I'm not fond of the when they try to spin history that way because I think most people know Laugh-In is what bumped Star Trek out of the lineup. That's, well, essentially, that, that's essentially the story. Well, that and the fact that nobody was watching Star Trek. Yeah, they were. The third season was a bit of a mess, though. Oh, Spock's yeah. brain. Yeah, turnabout intruder, baby. Oh, my God. There's yes. no room for women in your Starfleet. Um, it's so, horrible. Anyway. Uh, so, yes, here's what you get with this thing. This is just an absolutely fantastic box set. Everything looks gorgeous. Great transfers. I'm hoping a Blu-ray comes at some point, too. But 32-page uh, collector's book. 
uh, tons and tons of extras here. The um, uh, these are all taken from the original broadcast masters. And uh, the complete show, the complete series has never been available before. And this is, so this is, this is really historic. It is fantastic. You get interviews with everybody, including Ruth Buzzy and Dick Martin. Uh, you get the pilot episode, um, a tribute to George Schlatter, which is really sweet, bloopers, a lot of great stuff. It is, uh, this is television history. It is a significant show. It really paved the way for a lot of other shows to come. I don't think we would have a Saturday Night Live if not for laughing. Yeah, it definitely paved the way for those satirical, yeah, late night, irreverent. I don't think we would have politicians uh, basically making fools of themselves on television if not for laughing, because we forget it was Nixon who said sock it to me. Nixon had to go on laughing. Laughing became such a pop culture phenomenon. Nixon, in order to soften himself, to soften his image, he went on laughing and said sock it to me. And yet it didn't work because he's still Nixon. Yeah. Well, there you go. So anyway, beautiful box set, beautiful, colorful box set, uh, and uh, everything laugh in you could possibly hope for. So that is, uh, that is really, really uh, quite a, a, a treat. Goldie Hawn, of course, got her. Uh... That's right. Goldie Hawn got her start there and then won an Oscar for uh, Cactus Flower. Crazy, right? Cactus Flower. Oscar winner, Goldie Hawn. Goldie Hawn. So anyway. Uh, we did that. Uh, yes, I know we did. So um, yeah, let's let's. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna tell you. On. I'm just gonna tell you this is around because I have not watched the entire season. But this is South Park, the twentieth season, and um, you know I am under the impression that uh, the show is just as uh, funny as ever. Matt and Trey, as you know, have a very unusual way of working. They crank out an episode in a week, and if you work for them during the season, you are with them. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, sleeping on your desk in order to make their deadlines. Are they ever going to um, do a film, a feature film again? Or are they just in South Parkness? Because, I mean, come on. Team America is so beloved. Don't oh, they have the another one of those ever. in them? Something. Well, fun, something. I, that's, I mean, don't they even have a TV show? I mean, they, they had nothing else in them? I mean, they have, they have the, the Broadway show. Yeah. But their nice. Broadway, I mean, when you, when you consider, I mean, I just, I don't know why, you know. Too many years have gone by. Do a feature. I uh, well, basketball. They can. They basketball. They can have. Yeah, but they didn't. Uh, did they write and direct that? I guess they did, didn't they? I think so. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. That was dreadful. <laughs> that was dreadful. <laughs> that was really bad. Uh, I take it back. Don't don't do bas- basketball. Don't do that. A little bit oh, of vintage. Actually, it was directed by David Zucker. Okay. See. But written by Matt and Trey. Okay. That's and starring a, Matt and Trey. Yeah, and I, I knew that. Gosh, that was a terrible movie. Okay, uh, a little bit of classic TV here real quickly. Uh, Michael Landon in Highway to Heaven, Messages from Above. Oh, God. This is uh, a number of Highway to Heaven specials. And uh, this is from Mill Creek. This is, you know, just if you want to kind of, you know, watch a few random episodes that include the likes of a very, 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 very young Josh Brolin and a very young Paul Walker uh, and, you know, other assorted guest stars who are going to go on to much bigger and better things. Uh, Highway to Heaven, it was a thing in its day. And uh, then Where on Earth is Carmen Sandiego, the complete series. Uh, that thing was a phenomenon for like eight, yeah, eight seconds, then it, it went away. I know. On, it was a game, too, right? You know, we, yeah. people played it on the computer. Uh, yeah, this is 40 episodes. Not a, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a moment. It had its time. And uh, it's okay. It doesn't really age very well, I don't think. But, uh, you know, if you, if you want a little touch of nostalgic kitsch, then go for it. Uh, we keep getting Hee Haw special releases. This one is uh, Hee Haw, Pfft, You Was Gone. Uh, that's P-F-F-T, exclamation point, oh, for those terrible. that need a spelling for Pfft. Uh, Hee Haw, of course, as we all know, is basically the, uh, the, the uh, rural version of uh, Laugh-In. And uh, it did very well with it. Uh, it figured laugh in is a little bit too hip and sophisticated and, uh, and urban for and too New York and L.A. for the people in, uh, in the heartland. So we're going to give them the likes of Minnie Pearl instead of the likes of uh, Goldie Hawn. You know, I was flipping the channels the other day, speaking yeah. of which, flipping the channels. Yeah. And I saw something I didn't even know existed. What, did, what, 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 what? The Jimmy Dean Show. Yeah. From 1957 to 19. Uh, Absolutely, one of the great one of the great variety shows. Jimmy Dean, not the not Jimmy Dean the sausage guy, but Jimmy Dean the country well, country singer guy who was, was the very, sausage. Wasn't the sausage guy? No, he's not he the looks, same guy. He looks like the sausage. He's guy. He's not the same guy. This is Jimmy Dean. He was a, a singer and actor, and he was on many many episodes of Daniel Boone. 
It was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good show. I remember it. I remember it very well. What? It was, it was before you were born. No, I mean, fifty-seven reruns, oh, reruns, reruns, buddy. Okay, it's not like that. Yeah. Where, where, where did that? We I remember recently? Milton. I remember Milton Berle's Buick Hour too. I, that was before. Well, the Star of Theater. I saw all that stuff, man. This, they, is, they, this they, is Bob Hope. They reran that. They reran all that stuff late at night. Nine like eleven. A, how about that? Yeah, all late at night. I mean, like K Cal, which at the time was it was uh, K Cal uh, K K. Bef- it was. Uh, KHJ TV. KHJ. That's right. <gasps> oh my God. Can you believe I remember that? My child. Yeah. K-H-J-K. <laughs> Dating ourselves. Uh, yeah, no, I, all that stuff in rerun. The only stuff that they never reran, which I was really bummed about, was the, uh, was the Burns and Allen TV show. They never reran that for some strange reason. Anyway, great performances on here Marty Robbins, Merle Haggard, Dolly Parton, George Jones, Tammy Wynette. Uh, it's good. Hee haw. Pfft, you was gone. All right. Um, I'm looking up KHJ. KHJ. Oh, no. Okay, well, while you're doing KHJ, I'm going to do some uh, some uh, British TV. How's that? You okay with that, Mark? Uh, General Tire changed its new television station's call letters to KHJ in 1951. Uh-huh. One former employee referred to the call letters as standing for kindness, happiness, and joy. Are you serious? Although the call sign was likely randomly assigned. That's... I'm sure that's not true. So PBS had a recent installment of Masterpiece, King Charles III, uh, which is quite good. Um, A little bit more staid than I expected it to be, uh, which I later would discover. That's partly because it's based on a Broadway production um, that starred Tim Pickett Smith. But uh, this is... um, uh, this is quite good, actually, just as far as the legacy stuff, the uh, historical stuff that they're often doing on uh, uh, on PBS these days, and we, you know, and on Netflix, we got The Crown, and it's you know Victoria on on PBS, on and on and on. So plugging all of the holes in this uh, is King Charles III, which is very very interesting. Um, Mike Bartlett wrote the original stage play. Tim Pickett Smith starred in it, and he reprises his role here. And uh, the uh, the uh, this is quite interesting. Um, this is a basically speculative um, legacy drama. And the idea is that Prince Charles ascends to the throne on the death of uh, his mother, Queen Elizabeth. And uh, this speculates about what that would consist of. So it is, it is trying to sort of extend the, uh, extend what we know from, I mean, the King's speech and, you know, we've seen all of these things. It's sort of like Amazon's Man in the High Castle, but not yeah, as dramatic. Not, qu- not quite. Not as I mean, post-apocalyptic. Not as, not as post-apocalyptic. It's really, uh, it's really sort of using the future to reflect on the now a little bit. Um, and it does it in a very, very interesting way in a very intelligent way. And, uh, uh, you know, I wish it were a little bigger in scale. I wish it weren't quite so much of a play. Uh, I wish it didn't feel like quite so much of a play. But that said, it is, uh, it is still um, uh, very, very smart and, uh, and well-written. So uh, that is uh, King Charles III. We also have uh, Midsummer Murders, Series 19, Part 1. I'm very disappointed that they're doing the part one, part two thing that we get uh, ad nauseum with a lot of Paramount releases here. Uh, but this is uh, four very, very fine mysteries, uh, part of the Midsummer Mi- uh, Murders mystery series from Acorn. And uh, they are well-written and engaging, especially this one called Last Man Out, which, is, uh, which is deals with the murder of a cricket player, honestly. And, I, and I'm not kidding. You, you're, you're like, oh, great, murdered cricket player. Good, yeah, no, it really is actually really, really cool. I thought I was getting ahead of this one, and uh, I, I didn't. It was very, very smart. And, I, I, and I'm not a fan of cricket, you know. I'm a fan of rugby, not a fan of cricket. Uh, but, and you're, but you're a fan of baseball. Uh, yeah, I could sit and... Yeah, it's only because I get to eat. I'm a fan yeah, the, of... The, uh, the, uh, the, the Mets are... Uh... Are they doing well? No. Okay. And then we get uh, an Acorn TV original, Series 1 of Striking Out, which is a... Um, it's a it's a legal procedural set in Dublin, and uh, it's very very good. Uh, I'm not quite sure where this is all going to go. The characters are appealing, and the writing is solid. And uh, we'll see. 
uh, you know, there's some behind the scenes stuff here that uh, looks like this could be uh, could be a thing. So let's hope this continues to go into some interesting places. Good uh, good cast. I always like seeing good British actors. Who I know and Irish actors because you know that they're going to show up in uh, Hollywood movies playing superheroes and stealing all the roles from American actors in about five years. But before that happens, deservedly. <laughs> wow. So there we go. All right. Uh, what else we got here? Workaholics. I never liked this show, Wade. No. What is up with workaholics? Uh, I don't know. I don't watch it. Well, I don't watch it either. But all we all we can do is tell you that the complete series is now on DVD, Comedy Central. You get 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 a grip. So uh, yeah, audio commentary, bloopers, some alternate takes and deleted scenes, a rap reel, which is always kind of fun, uh, is for alcoholics. Comedy Central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. Eighty-six episodes. Wait. Oh my god. It, it ran that long. Yep. Yeah, just like seriously. It, Feels I like guess. it started like a year ago. <laughs> Didn't it? it is one of those under the radar culty Comedy yeah. Central things. All right. Uh, okay. So Incorporated. Did you Did you watch Incorporated? N- oh no. Oh, that was one that Affleck and Damon. Yeah. Uh, pr- yeah. No. It looked terrible. Yeah, but it, it is terrible. But why, why are they doing this? Do, do you know the story on this? Mm, I did I, not. I tried to find. I tried to figure out because it's like, okay, you know, as as a team, they don't do much really. They don't write anything they're together not a, anymore. They're not a producing team. They do Project Greenlight. They don't really do a lot of stuff. And then this thing comes out of the blue. And it's like incorporated, and it's you know, it's a it's a kind of a near apocalyptic future thing where. In, where corporations, uh, you know, kind of run everything. It sounds everything. stupid. And it sounds like something in the like Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock would have started in the eighties. Like the well, it's like the net meets Logan's Run Ugh. kind of sort of. Uh, but it, it doesn't. I mean, I don't. It like you watch this and you're just like, this is just. Anybody could have produced this. Why did you have to put your names on this? I don't get it. It's really I'm, a mystery I, to me. It is. I'm not sure. What like, they, I don't really even want to talk about this. I just, but I, I, I find it just so fascinating that, you know, with all the opportunities that they have to put their names on something to brand themselves as a team beyond Project Greenlight, that it was this. I mean, they're smart guys. Why? What? What? I don't know what they. I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know why there was. Maybe it was there. Was it their idea? Or yeah. Maybe they're trying to get their buddy's idea made. Yeah. Something. I don't know. Or maybe they're finally going to admit. They're gay. Well, you know, not that that's a bad thing. Seinfeld joke. Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? That was the Seinfeld joke. Not that there's anything wrong <laughs> with that. Way to screw that up big time. I messed well up the done. joke. Not that, I was reaching into the grab bag. Okay, so um, we have, let's, uh, well, we got a few other things, a few other TV things here. Uh, Grey Lady with Eric Dane, Natalie Z, uh, or Zia, is it Zia? How do you pronounce it? And Amy I, Madigan? I've never heard of her. Okay, but you know who Eric Dane is. Yeah. yeah. He was he was the he guy was from... Anatomy. Uh, he was... He was uh, and he's on The Last Ship. He was the guy who shut down production of The Last Ship because he, he was uh, suffering from depression. Oh, I didn't know that. That is true. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I know Eric Dane came on to... Uh, 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 Grey's Anatomy to offset McDreamy, and he was like, what, McSteamy? Is that what they called him? McSweaty? Why do you know this? I don't know. Tell me, you uh, do you watch Grey's Anatomy? You do, don't you? I, I did for about four seasons, yeah, pretty religiously. <laughs> That's yeah. horrible. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. What can I say? It was on at the right. It was Sunday nights. There was nothing else going on. You know, you sit there. You read a book. Watch a ball game. Ball game. Ball game. Listen to you, Mister Intellectual. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, Great Lady is uh, is okay. Um, Eric Dane is is fine. Um, this is a uh, you know police procedural basically. Uh, doesn't really deserve to become a series. I think the idea was that this was supposed to become a series at some point. But uh, in any case, it's uh, you know he, he he plays a um, a Boston detective whose partner is killed, and you know then you got to go and try to solve it as they often do uh anyway and it becomes a little cat and mouse mouse and cat thing and it's it's you know eric dane is a decent actor but you know could be better anyway uh then we have a new movie this week the only new opener is chips uh and mark who is falling asleep in oh, front so of me i i have to be work i have to be work yes. at five in the morning i'm sorry that means that i have to wake up i have a four-year-old i wake up at four Okay, here, well, but here's the I thing. I wake up at 5. I wake up at 4.15 in the morning, yeah. get to the office at 4.45 in the morning, and then 
It is a nonstop rocket slide until oh. we do a live show at 9 a.m. Oh. So imagine coming to work at 5 in the morning and having to do the Today Show live yeah. in five in four hours. Oh. That's my day. That's not I am fun. so effing tired. Well, so real quickly then. Uh, chips, chips, terrible. Terrible. Awful. Really well, I mean, come on. You know, you know what? You know you, what? You know it's what, still better than Baywatch. You know when you saw the trailer, chips would be yeah. terrible. Because it was but, just a bunch of homophobic jokes. Like, really, that's the best you got. You know, here, let me. but here's the thing. Why is it? And I said this on the radio when we covered Baywatch. And Baywatch, by the way, is just it's really terrible, even though Dwayne Johnson's great in it. But, you know, like the first big joke in Baywatch is that a guy... The, you know, it's always the Jewish jokes, right? It's like the, the, the one has gay jokes, the other one has Jewish jokes. And it's the Jewish kid. And, of course, it's a bar mitzvah joke. And he, he sees the, uh, the, the actress who's playing the Pamela Anderson role, the CJ part, right? And he's so hot for her. And he gets aroused and then trips and falls onto a beach chair and gets his junk stuck in the slats. And then there's a whole thing about, like, emergency first aid to get him unstuck from, from the slats. Now, seriously, it took like five screenwriters to come up with that? Are you kidding me? Come on. That's so hilarious. Way. Between, you just don't know chips, between Chips and Baywatch, here's my question. Didn't these guys pay any, to, any attention to uh, uh, 21 Jump Street and 22 Jump Street? Those are funny. They're hilarious. Those are great. Anyway. Okay, uh, uh, Cannes Film Festival, best director, Amat Escalante for... Eli, H-E-L-I, uh, which is a gripping Mexican film that uh, is re- almost impo- very difficult to watch. This is from a strand, and uh, it, is a, it is yet another birth of a very, very talented uh, Mexican director who is certain to have a Hollywood career uh, all centered around the drug war, which just shows no signs of stopping. Uh, it's like half that country is owned by the drug cartels at this point. And the character Eli uh, is a kid with a who, who gets involved in the drug war because of his sister, and uh, it is uh, it, it winds up basically having just the most horrifying effect on friends and family and everyone around them. Um, really, a, a incredibly well done film, very very deserving of its awards. Uh, beautifully transferred uh, by the Strand people on Blu-ray. And Strand does not release a lot of films on Blu-ray, so pay attention to that fact. And then Wang Bing, Chinese director, uh, made a film called Three Sisters, which I find uh, very interesting. Um, This is uh, from Icarus, who uh, really found kind of a gem here. The movie was made in 2012 and had not been picked up or released by anybody since. Uh, I believe Icarus may have released it at the time theatrically, so uh, it certainly was their discovery at the time, but uh, it has not uh, been snatched away by anybody else, and my guess is that the rights may have been available for somebody else to distribute. In any case, a 2012 film, uh, two and a half hours long, and uh, uh, sort of a, a very, very gripping look. It's a documentary film. It's a gripping, gripping look at uh, three sisters who live in this incredibly backwards mountain part of China where nothing has changed in like two centuries. It's in Yunnan province, and it is so difficult. And um, it is, it's amazing that they were able to get a camera crew there and, and hang with them and sort of uh, detail their lives. Really a, just a, a profoundly touching and powerful movie gripping for the full run of its two hours and 35-some uh, and, and minutes. Really an extraordinary movie called Three Sisters by Wang Bing. Really a great documentary. Also includes a booklet and uh, an essay by Nick Pinkerton on Wang Bing's career as a documentarian, which is worth checking out because his other films have never been shown here. All right, um, Mark, shall we get into... Uh, we got a... We gotta, you know, we have, we have uh, Pink Panther stuff coming. Shall uh. we talk Pink Panther? Oh, is that the Pink Panther box set? Yep. Which you're going to give me? No. But, uh, hold on here. Oh, but please drop all those. Please drop all those. <laughs> oh, <laughs> damn it. So, here's what we're going to do. You're going to give me the Pink Panther box no, set? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But here's what's interesting. So, a little bit of backstory. Uh, oh, I'm going to go to sleep again. Yeah. <laughs> MGM, some years ago, released a complete Pink Panther box set. A big, plush, fluffy, pink thing 
that was it had a you know a booklet and a whole lot of fun stuff in it and uh, all the Pink Panther movies and well not all of the Pink Panther movies all the Peter Sellers Pink Panther movies uh, along with uh, a, a couple of not Pink Pan- uh, Peter Sellers well it, along with uh, what is it the uh, uh, Inspector Clouseau starring Alan Arkin and it had all the cartoons. So what we get here are is the Pink Panther film collection from Shout Factory. God bless them. We love them. But these are only the Peter Sellers movies. No cartoons. So we don't have... So if, you, if you're thinking about getting rid of your... No, don't. Uh, you want to hang on to that because that's going to be still a collector's set. But it's nice to have just the Sellers films on Blu-ray. And what amazing movies they are. All six of them. Brand new transfers, new interviews, audio commentaries, featurettes, all that stuff, plus a booklet. It is absolutely great. Gorgeous. These movies haven't looked this good in ages, and they're still funny, and uh, Sellers is still absolutely amazing. Now, here's what's interesting. And Blake Ed, you know, the commentary on the Pink Panther is the original Blake Edwards commentary. Just want to say that. It's the original Blake Edwards commentary, uh, and there's a great documentary, The Pink Panther Story, um, all this really, really good stuff. Now, here's what's interesting. When Shout Factory announced that, knowing that there are other Pink Panther movies that are um, not part of this canon, immediately somebody got busy over at MGM and Kino Lorber, I'm going to assume it's people at Kino Lorber, and said, hey, let's piggyback on that. And sure enough, they did. So this week we also have, from Kino Lorber, to complement your Pink Panther Shout Factory uh, Complete Peter Sellers, the uh, original Inspector Clouseau with Alan Arkin, which is still great, right? Do we like this? Of course we do. Alan Arkin. Come on. Alan Arkin was a good Clouseau as well. Doesn't well, get he wasn't credit. Peter Sellers, but he was a good Clouseau. Yeah, he's a good Clouseau. And this is directed by Bud Yorkin. Great director. Comedy guy. Come on. He's the Yorkiniest. Yeah, we love Bud Yorkin. Uh, from 1968. And uh, this has a, an audio commentary as well from uh, film historian Patrick Maynard. And uh, then they also gave us, we have two more, two more from MGM and Kino. We get Curse of the Pink Panther on Blu-ray, which is not very good. Uh, this, is a, this has a very, very troubled history. This is a 1983 film that Blake Edwards directed that has uh, David Niven and just about everybody else uh, on the planet in it. And Ted Wass is uh, trying to anchor this thing and doing a very, very bad job. Um, I mean, what kind of, I mean, what kind of uninspired casting was it, Ted Wass? It was bad. It was a bad movie. However, it is still canon because Blake Edwards directed it. Henry Mancini did the music. And there you go. So Herbert Lom is in it, Robert Wagner, you know, Robert Loggia. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a thing. It's still canon. It's not, you know, it's, it's misguided. It's a disaster, but it's still, it's canon. And then lastly, we have Roberto Benigni in Son of the Pink Panther. Again, canon. Blake Edwards, right? Right? This was a misfire, too. This was terrible. This was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. But That was like Benini at, uh, at the time when we were willing to culturally accept him. Yeah. Now it's like, I don't know what happened to you for yeah, the last 10 years. No, no, it's, it, it's all over. It, he came and went. But Herbert Lom's still in this. Even Steve Martin. I'm like, you know what, Steve Martin? Okay. You know, one of the great comedians. Now let's see what Steve Martin does with it. But Herbert Lom. Herbert Lom's still in this. He's the 93. longest. He did, just didn't go away. Just I remember, won't. I only love Stephen Lom in The Dead Zone, where he plays that crazy doctor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, uh, this is from 1993, and uh, it's got a, a very interestingly strange commentary from uh, Jason Simos of the Peter Sellers Appreciation Society. A couple of deleted scenes and uh, extended trailer and uh, making a featurette. That's really it's all on there. But it's a lot of Pink Panther this week is what I'm saying. The Pink Panther box set with the Peter Sellers films from uh, Shot Factory. Uh, and then uh, Son of the Pink Panther. Curse of the Pink Panther and Inspector Clouseau with the amazing Alan Arkin from uh, Kino. So a lot of fun. And the box set, you're gonna give me that. I am gonna. St- I'm gonna. I'm gonna do a marathon with my daughter. What I was gonna say earlier, talking about the Batman films. So because my mother-in-law was in Batman uh, Returns, uh, my wife was scouring it, looking for all the little moments where she might spot her mom in the in the crowd scenes. And my daughter is watching this while she's doing it, and now she's obsessed with Batman and that funny penguin guy. 
She thinks oh, the penguin's hilarious. Well, Danny DeVito's disgusting as the penguin in that thing. Yeah, does, does he like drool and eat fish? Oh, and he's it's bleeding horrible. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like I'm thinking, boy, are you gonna love Burgess Meredith so much funnier? Yeah. So I gotta, I gotta show her that this week. Anyway. Uh, all right. So let's see. Let me get into some classic movie stuff. Oh. Uh, let's see. You know, um, I have this set aside for. Okay, so uh, this is foreign, actually, but um, I'm going to cover it anyway because it's Criterion. Uh, Kenji Mizuguchi's Ugetsu, which is uh, one of his great uh, accomplishments. 1953, one of the, the early Japanese New Wave masterpieces. Um, really an amazing movie. Uh, Mizuguchi is kind of the, the godfather of the uh, Japanese New Wave. Uh, definitely was uh, a... I don't want to. It wasn't a precursor to uh, Kurosawa, but he sort of hit big earlier than Kurosawa. They were making movies very much at the same time, uh, and Mizuguchi made Ogetsu in 1953 and uh, just won the admiration of the world very, very deservedly. Um, this is an amazing movie. It is a. It is. Uh, it is a ghost story that predates Kwaidan, but it is a very, very literate kind of. Uh, kind of a, 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 an existential drama that ranks right up there with the seventh seal and it's just it's amazing it's really amazing to watch it's a beautiful beautiful film uh, deals with so many tough existential and social issues uh, great commentary here by Tony Raines who's who knows this film inside out and upside down and it's very very clear there's also a 1975 documentary on uh, the life and career of Mizuguchi uh, and a, a really great 2005 interview with the uh, first assistant director on the film who gives you some amazing stories as well. So uh, a lot of great stuff on this. Blu-ray special edition, Ugetsu, Kenji Mizuguchi's amazing masterpiece from 1953, one of the greatest Japanese films of all time. What? That's a bold claim, Wade Major. It is. It's great. Ugetsu. Have you seen every single Japanese film ever made in their entire filmmaking uh, history? Let me count. Uh, and then you have ranked them. Yeah, all, except for the anime. I haven't seen all the anime. You've seen all the anime twice. Uh, maybe. Uh, what else we got here? We have the lawnmower man. You know, back in the day, this movie was a bit of a phenomenon because this movie actually, even though it's like a B movie. I hated this movie. Even though it's a it's a B movie with Jeff Fahey, the only the only thing he was ever known for, Jeff Fahey, Pierce Brosnan's in this too. Um, this was a film that uh, it hit at a moment when virtual reality was like this dream thing that looked like it was happening, and it was starting to hit the culture that virtual reality is this cool futuristic thing that might happen someday. So Lawnmower Man came out at the very right time, and it was a bit of a moderate success. They actually made a st they made a sequel, right? Did they make a sequel to Lawnmower Man too? Yeah, they did. Like I think they may have made two sequels. And like yeah. I, I don't get it. Whatever. I I mean they're 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 really poorly done B movies, but somehow again it was really on the forefront of you know of uh, of the of the trend of caring about the cool future that virtual reality represents. Um, so yeah. So it's an adventure film, um, you know, evil lurking in the uh, in the shop, which is a uh, this, gr this secret group that you know seeks to that wants to use the virtual reality technology to create this like this big war machine, to destroy the world. Um, yeah. So Brett Leonard did it. There's all sorts of you know futuristic effects, at least futuristic futuristic for the time. Um, I, all I can say is that if you know what this movie is, mm -hmm. you can rent it. Yeah. If you don't know what it is, don't waste your time. I remember walking out of the uh, screening of this thing. Was it a screening at the time? I, yeah, I guess it was a screening. Uh, I had just started reviewing movies. And uh, I remember thinking, uh, uh, this New Line thing isn't going to last. Because this is a New Line movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. And New Line was, was not yet a Warner Brothers company at the time. This was like one of their big attempts, if memory serves, this is one of their big attempts to sort of be a studio, right? And... Uh, and I remember thinking, oh, this isn't going to last. And then Warner Brothers bought them, and they became part of Time Warner. But, uh, yeah, boy. Boy, I hated this movie. <laughs> I really did. It, was, it, was a, it, was a, it, it had a pop culture moment. You yeah, know? it did. It sure did. Okay, so a uh, ton of stuff from the, uh, from the Kino people. 
And uh, I'm, let me burn through this because there's, a, there's some great stuff. I just spent the last week really kind of uh, reviewing a lot of this. Um, we mentioned the Chinese film Three Sisters. There's another Three Sisters out this week, and people may get confused. So keep them straight. One is on DVD. The other one is available on Blu-ray. One is from uh, Icarus. The other one is from Kino. And uh, the one from Kino is uh, Three Sisters... Anton Chekhov's Three Sisters. This is based on the Anton Chekhov play from the American Film Theater version. Uh, and this is the, directed by Laurence Olivier, produced by Na- the Royal National Theater. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a very literate, uh, surprisingly engaging for Chekhov, uh, 1970 British production that uh, really should be seen if you're a Chekhov fan. And even if you're not, Chekhov sometimes can be, sometimes can be really, really taxing. How about Sulu? Can he be taxing? Oh, I knew you were going to do a Star Trek joke. Why did I know that? But um, this, is, this is the one that you know, most people t- say is the most accessible of, his, uh, of his, uh, uh, his plays. And Olivier does a really, really good job with this. So um, Alan Bates is, uh, is phenomenally good in this as well. He was really a big deal at the time. Joan Plowright, who was married to Olivier, is also very, very good. So um, even if you're not a Chekhov fan, check out uh, the Blu-ray of Anton Chekhov's Three Sisters, directed by Lawrence Olivier. It's a really great release from Kino. Um, Here's some other stuff from Kino. Eight Million Ways to Die with Jeff Bridges and Rosanna Arquette. Great, great trash from the 1980s. This is not a good movie, Um, but I still enjoy it. And I think that has to do with the fact that Hal Ashby, even when he is in the waning stages of his career, he can still bring it. Well, he, he had that magical decade. Yeah. That 10-year run. That was un- and this is at Which the is tail impressive. end. Yeah. The tail end of his magical 10-year run. Yeah. And this really is... It's not a very good movie. It's not a very good movie. And it's not a horrendous movie, but it's just sort of everything that was wrong with the uh, with the 1980s. It's just the wrong collection of people working on a thing. You know, for example, like uh, Hal Ashby directing a screenplay co-written by Oliver Stone. Does that make sense in any world? It, you know, it reminds you that Oliver Stone started as a screenwriter. He did yeah. a lot of screenwriting. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, look, an Oliver Stone screenplay directed by Brian De Palma, that makes sense. Directed by uh, uh, Alan Parker. That makes sense. Hal Ashby? No. Yeah. No, because Hal Ashby's all about, like, relationships and humanity and humanistic and, like, the little moments. And Stone is about, like, you know, g- snorting cocaine and shooting people and, and, you know, beating people's testicles out. I mean, that's, you know, Stone is bombast. Hal Ashby isn't bombast. That's he a isn't. bad... It's a bad marriage. I mean, the screenplay was co-written by uh, uh, David Lee Henry, so Stone isn't the only guy involved here, but it's just, it's not really Hal Ashby material. Still, you know, bad Ashby is better than, than no Ashby. So. Bashby? Uh, we also have Thunderbirds Are Go and Thunderbirds 6. The two Thunderbirds feature films uh, are out in a double feature from Kino Studio Classics. A lot of fun. Love the Thunderbirds on TV as a series. Uh, they're still great in these two films. And uh, Sylvia Anderson and uh, David Lane do the audio commentary here. There's also a secondary audio commentary uh, with uh, film with other people here. Nick Redman and Jeff Bond. Nick Redman, again, who has done you know commentaries for a lot of people, but who is also a principal in Twilight Time, uh, does the uh, co-anchors that secondary commentary on Thunderbirds or Go. And then Greg Ford and uh, cartoon writer William Hohauser do the secondary commentary on Thunderbird 6. A lot of featurettes, a lot of fun stuff on how the uh, Super Mario Nation works. Really, really great. I, I, I'm just thrilled that this is out on, uh, on Blu-ray. That's a, that's a great get. Uh, Gloria Swanson in Zaza, directed by Alan Dwan, who would go on to do a lot of great sound films. Uh, this is a, a kind of a legendary 1923 Gloria Swanson silent. Worth checking out. Uh, it is sort of more interesting as, a, as an artifact of history than it is just for its entertainment value, but it is, uh, it is worth checking out, definitely, just because it's Swanson and Dwan, and they would go on to be really, really significant figures. Uh, this is a great transfer. This is uh, probably looks better than most silent films on Blu-ray these days, so uh, give that a check. Uh, the Depati Freling animation collection continues to be released on Blu-ray through Kino with the Blue Racer. Um, it's a little bit creepy, you know. These, the, the, if you watch the um, uh, the Pink Panther cartoons, that's a better representation of this style of animation from this particular a- animation organization. But uh, there are some, you know, the, the, the shorts here are are modestly engaging, and there's a couple of documentaries on here as well that are uh, and some audio commentaries. 
Um, we also have from the American Film Theater uh, another uh, Kino Classics release, Maximilian Schell in The Man in the Glass Booth, which is uh, which got him an Oscar nomination in 1975. You ever seen this? I have not. Yeah, I hadn't either. The, the makeup is really, really quite bad. Arthur Hiller directed this as well. He was busy then. Um, the... Um, the idea here, it's, it's, it feels a little theatrical, uh, and Maximilian Schell is good despite the makeup. The restoration is, is really good. The transfer is very, very good. The, uh, but as far as movie, you know, this gets into um, uh, Nazi war crimes, and there's a lot, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of post-World War II, uh, the residue of World War II and the Holocaust, that, that, you know, how, that it continues to trail after the war many decades, and Drag other people into its uh, in, into its uh, into the ugly center. Anyway, um, the movie doesn't age very well, but the performance is still good, and it's a nice little artifact of history. So that's from the American Film Theater uh, with Maximilian Schell, and then just a few final ones here. Billy Wilder's One Two Three, which is a little bit of a forgotten Billy Wilder film from 1961. Uh, you know, he had done. Um, it, 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 people were sort of, you know, he had done The Apartment and uh, Some Like It Hot, and in that particular era, he kind of, uh, he made a few that, for the Marish Company, that didn't really uh, catch fire in the same way. I think this is a much better film than most people give it credit for. He wrote it with Izzy Diamond, as he did most of his great movies, and uh, James Cagney, not exactly the guy you'd normally plug into a Billy Wilder movie, but he does a great job. I think this is uh, uh, a, a, a still a very, very funny film. Deserves to be rediscovered. And, uh, yeah, give it a shot. That's, uh, that's out there on Blu-ray as well. And then The Parodying Case, uh, another Alfred Hitchcock film that uh, oftentimes gets a little bit overlooked. Uh, this is from 1947 and uh, is still really, really a fantastic film, beautifully put together. Gregory Peck and Ann Todd, once a wife of David Lean, by the way, do a great, great job in this, uh, along with Charles Lawton and uh, Ethel Barrymore, uh, one, of, one of Hitchcock's better thrillers from that, uh, that period. That's when he's really getting his American chops on. Uh, Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas in Tough Guys. You remember this? I do remember that. Yeah, Actually, 1986. This was supposed to be the... Uh, it was like, let's go dig up a couple of guys who had been tough but never made a movie together, and let's, uh, let's basically stick them together as, as old guys. And we could argue that this was the first Expendables, right? That's kind Kirk of. Du Kirk Douglas still around. I remember the premiere of this. Oh, God. You know that? I remember the premiere of this. I was, uh, was an assistant manager at the uh, Plaza Theater at the time, and the premiere was at the Bruin, and they had these little, um, th they had a whole bunch of like funky swag. I remember it very, very well. Tough guys. I also remember that was around the same time that uh, City Heat. Remember, With Burt Burt, Reynolds, Burt Reynolds and Clint Eastwood. Yeah, similar uh, similar gig. Yeah, they were all doing those those dig up the old guys and put them in movies together. Anyway, uh, you know what? It, it's a better movie than I remember it being. Uh, Jeff Canoe does an audio commentary, and then there's a trailer as well. It's fun. Uh, you know, these guys. You can't really put those guys together in a movie and have it not be fun. And then lastly, we're going to go out on this. The long, 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 long overdue Blu-ray release, finally, of 1492. Uh, I don't know why this took so long. I don't know why Kino had to, to pry this loose from Paramount. I don't know why Paramount didn't do a special edition release of this on their own. Makes no sense to me. Ridley Scott uh, directed one of two um, uh, anniversary, uh, Columbus anniversary movies, in uh, 1992, that's right. Remember, it was the 500, the 500 year anniversary of Columbus's alleged discovery of America, um, discounting everyone who discovered it before him. But nevertheless, Columbus gets the credit for it. Uh, and uh, there were two movies, and the other one was that one with George Corifus, and it was just that was that just was horrible. lame. And Columbus, that's right. Oh, that was a dreadful movie. Um, this one is not great. It's got problems. But Ridley Scott really directs the hell out of it. He does. He just directs the hell out of it. And uh, Rosalind Bosch uh, wrote a very, very literate screenplay. I did the press day for this, and I remember it very, very well. Uh, it, it was, Gerard Depardieu was thrilled that I spoke French because there was no one else there who spoke French, and he pulled me aside and just started asking me, like hitting me with all kinds of questions. So I was like, I, I really? He just, he's a chatterbug. It's a, it was the weirdest thing. It was the funniest, strangest thing. 
But, um, yeah, uh, two and a half hours of Ridley Scott just really working it. It's a little bit simplistic in how it kind of whittles the, the sto- whittles a story out of that whole episode. But, nonetheless, it's a really well-done film. And, most importantly, it has the other Vangelis score for a Ridley Scott movie other than Blade Runner. And it is, it is a great score. It is one of Vangelis' great, great scores. I am a huge Vangelis fan and cannot get enough of uh, his score in 1492. So uh, there it is. That's our show for the week. Yay. Um, so we may have a show next week if I can rope Tim into doing something. Uh, don't know if he's going to be in town. He may be leaving town as well. So stay tuned. There may be a show. There may not be. The week after will not be a show. I will be uh, doing my little stint over in Jordan. And uh, I will try to do updates on the Facebook page to uh, share the, the, uh, the exploits with people. But uh, otherwise... That's it, Mark. Any uh, any wishes? Any well wishes for the Fourth of July? Since you won't be here, you want to wish people a happy Fourth of July? No. No. Well, there it is. See you soon.